Dr. Stamets' thesis group. We have the talk on how does emotion enhance memory. Thank you. I'm Betsy Covington. I'm Avery Juice. I'm Timmy Phillips. I'm Eileen Robertson. I'm Sam Tigan. So what is emotion enhanced memory? This is a question that scholars have been trying to answer for decades. First off, I'd like you all to think about your moving day here at Wofford during your first year. What were you feeling on that day? Were you scared, nervous, excited, or tears shed? Now I want you all to think about what you ate for lunch the day after your moving day. Maybe it was pizza or chicken or salad. You're probably better able to recall the details of your moving day as compared to what you ate for lunch. This is because it's believed if you have an emotional reaction towards an event, you're more likely to remember that event as compared to a neutral event. But why is this the case? Scholars have come up with many different theories as to why this is the case, but for the most part they have all been able to agree on the fact that it has something to do with attention. This is because it is believed that emotion enhanced memory is due to the fact that you allocate more of your attention towards an emotionally arousing stimulus as compared to a neutral stimulus. And that is why you're better able to remember, remember the details of your moving day as compared for what, to what you ate for lunch the day after. But this is not the whole story and we're here to tell you why. So we know that memory is better for emotional events, but what happens if a neutral event is immediately followed by an emotional event? Does that change your memory for the neutral event? To make this question a little clearer, I'm going to tell you a story about a time when I had my passport stolen in the airport in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> so the woman, who had, the woman who stole it had to be the person who walked into the bathroom after me. But I couldn't remember her face because at first she was just a woman who walked into the bathroom after me. Her face was completely neutral and it didn't become emotional until I realized that my passport was stolen. The same happens in eyewitness testimonies. The faces that pass us by are neutral until something happens that makes them emotional. The problem is that when something neutral is followed by something emotional, often our memory for the neutral event is worse. This begs the question, is memory enhanced for emotional stimuli, or is memory deficient for neutral stimuli? Most past studies which have found that emotional stimuli are remembered better than neutral stimuli have shown sets of pictures in which emotional events and neutral events are intermixed. However, one issue with this is that emotional stimuli are inherently more related than neutral stimuli, as they all share some sort of thematic or categorical relationship. An example of this is the relationship between a gun and a dead body compared to the relationship between a bull and a fire hydrant. The connection between the gun and the dead body is much more easily accessible in your brain than the connection between the latter two. Moreover, when mixed with neutral images, uh, emotional images tend to be more distinct. As a result, these studies have found that they focused on the enhancement of processing of emotional events. However, it may be the case that processing for neutral events is deficient rather than processing for emotional events being enhanced. To take a closer look at this, we measured brain activity and conducted a memory test in which um, the differences between emotional and neutral stimuli were analyzed. So what do we mean by brain activity exactly? Susan, let me tell you know. <laughs> In the current study, we measured brain activity through electroencephalography, otherwise known as EEG. Um, so to do so, we measured changes in electrical activity on the scalp of participants through electrodes. Um, this change in electrical activity upon the scalp reveals changes in electrical activity upon the cortex of the brain. Uh, from there, we averaged the electrical activity that we measured from the cortex of the, of the brain in response to repeated events. Um, we average it, and then we can actually analyze this event-related potential data, or ERP. So in the current study, we used visual, uh, well, first, sorry, my bad, uh, for the results of the study um, to show that um, ERP data indicates subsequent memory performance, we have this picture of a brain. Any place where you see this brain in our results will demonstrate that we found a relationship between ERP data and subsequent memory performance, whereas a brain with an X over it indicates that there was no such relationship found. And then we use images. <laughs> uh, so we use images that were negative in valence, related neutral, and so by related we mean they were all organized around a theme, in this case domestic living. Um, and then <laughs> unrelated neutral images, such as, well, boring things. Um, <laughs> All of these images were balanced first on physical attributes through a pilot study. Um, by physical attributes, I mean their brightness as well as their physical complexity were all balanced. Furthermore, we made sure that negative images were significantly more emotional than our neutral images, and that negative and related neutral images were significantly more interrelated 
that underlay neutral images. Um, we also record heart rate data um, and balance all images according to how arousing they are, so that way we can eliminate that covariant. So, my favorite part, let's try it. <laughs> so this is the part where we have audience participation. You will now be presented with a series of images. So please, um, you'll be presented with a fixation cross, an image, a fixation cross, so on and so forth. If you have to blink, please do so during the fixation cross. <laughs> Following that, you'll be given a distractor task of math. I hope you're excited for that. And then a free recall task. So let's get started. Now let's do some math. Shout out. Eight minus six. Two. Four plus three. Seven. Two plus one. Three. Seven minus five. Two. Nine minus four. Five. What do you recall? Yes, you're all correct now. This is great. So this is a great um, just display of what we did in the current study. We, we show participants lists of images, either a pure list showing images of only one type, uh, so either just negative, just related neutral, or unrelated neutral, or we show them in what y'all just saw, a mixed list, in which there's a mixture of all three image types together. Uh, following which, they did a distractor task of a minute of basic math, um, and then they had three minutes to free recall um, any images, as many as they could, given the basic descriptors of the images they were showing. So now for everyone's favorite part of the presentation, graphs. <laughs> um, so on the x-axis you can see those were the categories that we uh, used for visual stimuli. So negative would have been the snake or photos of tarantulas or unpleasant uh, emotional items. And then the related neutral were the items that were neutral but domestically related together in the list. And then unrelated neutral were the items that were seemingly random but did not evoke any sort of emotional activity. And then on the y-axis, we have percent remembered, which was the uh, stimuli that participants recalled when asked, what do you remember after the distractor task? So as you can see, overall, <coughs> negative images were remembered much better than the other two. And then the second best remembered um, category was the related neutral. And the worst remembered was the unrelated neutral. And we expect the negative to be the highest because there is that emotional component of negative valence. They're unpleasant and there's usually more attention given to negative stimuli. We also expected that there would be significantly more brain activity when negative stimuli were presented and asked to be recalled because we saw this increase in memory for negative stimuli. What we didn't expect was that for related neutral items, even though they were better remembered than unrelated neutral items, there was no significant amount of brain activation when related neutral items were presented or when they were recalled. But there was significant brain activity during the unrelated neutral stimuli. So the reason that we think this might have occurred is because uh, there might have been easier retrieval for related neutral items because they're related, they're organized into a specific category in the brain. So if you have something domestic, like a piece of furniture, it might be easier to remember other domestic related items because they're in the same category, which leads to less need for activity in the brain to recall them. And then uh, to test for distinctiveness, which is kind of like a stimulus salience, how much of a pop factor does um, one stimuli have over another, and how does this lead to better memory? Um, we saw that of the way we tested this was we had uh, two conditions that we presented the stimuli in. We had a pure condition in which the list consisted of items all from one category. So they would be all negative images, all related neutral, all unrelated neutral. And then we had the mixed condition, which is what we showed you earlier, which is negative image, unrelated neutral, related neutral, etc. They were mixed together. And what we found was that it did not matter how the stimuli were presented. It did not have an effect on whether or not you remembered something in each category. Yes, negative was still remembered more, but it didn't, remember, it didn't matter how the stimuli were presented. And then when we um, compared with our ERP data, um, we found that 
across the board, um, there was significantly more brain activation during the presentation of stimuli in a mixed condition, but um, there wasn't as much brain, significant brain activity during the pure condition, and this did not result in better memory for any category across the board. So whether or not images were remembered did not depend on how they were presented. That finding was um, reaffirmed. And um, it was also interesting because, you know, brain activity uh, that we found in our study kind of conflicted with another one that we were reading in previous literature. And then as far as when this brain activity was occurring, we found that brain activity was significantly higher in the early and middle time periods of when visual stimuli were presented, but it kind of tapered off towards the end. So this led us to ask, why are we seeing um, significant amounts of brain activity that don't always correlate with better memory? So why do we see differences in the ERP data but not in memory? So one advantage to our study is that we were able to look at this from a lot of different angles, which allowed us to look at the effects on the brain, but it also allowed us to look at what was happening behaviorally with memory. This paints a more accurate but also a more complicated picture, so we're going to go through the discussion a little bit here. Um, it could be the case that um, semantic relatedness is more applicable um, at retrieval, working kind of like a domino effect, so the memory of one thing triggers the memory of other more related things. Uh, on the other hand, distinctiveness may be more applicable at encoding. Um, when you're tasked with trying to remember something and you're given a series of various neutral images such as like a desk or a chair or a cup, but then all of a sudden there's a man with a gun, you're much more likely to remember the man with the gun rather than the neutral images because it's more distinct and captures your attention compared to the other dissimilar images. However, if the man with the gun is presented with a whole bunch of other images similar to that, you're less likely to remember it because it doesn't capture your attention and have that pop-out effect. Um, however, if encoding is enhanced, doesn't it seem as though retrieval would also be enhanced? Well, this may be the case. Um, it could be the case that the brain data show that there was an increase in encoded detail, but our recall test just couldn't pick up on that. So for this study, the method of retrieval that we used was free recall, which is one of the most difficult memory tasks. So if we had used maybe like a lower level method of retrieval, such as recognition or something like that, um, we think that we may have seen those differences in memory between mixed and pure lists like the uh, ERP data show. So the current study answered a lot of questions, but it left us with some more questions. Earlier I talked about how memory for a neutral event is often worse when it is followed by an emotional event. In our study, we found encoding differences whenever something emotional came before or after something neutral, as in the mixed list, but we didn't specifically test if order matters. Thus, we designed a new study that will further analyze this question. In order to make it clear what we want to know, I'm going to tell you another story. <laughs> Imagine you're at the bank, and you hold the door for this man. You go about your business, and all of a sudden, the man pulls out a gun. Now, let's think about it in a different way. You're at the bank when you see a man walk in with a gun. Later on, you're asked to identify him as a suspect. In the first situation, he was someone neutral who then became emotional, but in the second situation, he was someone emotional who then became neutral. In which instance would memory be better or worse? In order to test this question, our new study will present participants with a series of neutral faces and that are matched with one sentence descriptors. These sentences are either neutral, such as he collects coins, positive, such as he won the lottery, or negative, such as he drowned a kid. These sentences are then paired with neutral faces, and each face is presented twice, once with a neutral sentence and once with an emotional sentence. And so what we want to see is whether the neutral, um, the neutral sentence is remembered best when, or the neutral face is remembered best when the neutral came before emotional or when neutral became, came after emotional. And these results will have important implications regarding the accuracy of memory, especially in facets such as eyewitness testimonies. Um, and so it will also help us further our answer to the question of how emotion influences memory. So this was a huge project. Many thanks to all who helped us with it, especially Dr. Stein as our thesis advisor, and Vanessa Zarubin as this was a part of her honors thesis project, Dr. Martzberg's physics research group, and all of you who participated today. Personality 
background. Do you guys do any personality background uh, collection? Because there are some individuals who are hyper vigilant about threat. So if you're paranoid going into a into a into a bathroom in Thailand, which I would be, um, then there's no such thing as a neutral face because I'm thinking that someone's going after my passport. That's actually a great point. So we tested for BAI and BDI, so that's anxiety and depression, and we actually found significance with anxiety. So people with anxiety or higher levels had more um, had higher memory. What was weird is that they also had better memory than the non-anxious individuals for the unrelated neutral. And so we looked into that research and we found um, that sometimes people with anxiety like to have a coping mechanism. So like they have this attention bias towards the negative images because they're hypervigilant, but also they need something to kind of draw them away and cope with their anxiety. So they'll pay more attention to something like a blue mug or something random. So there were differences and we accounted for those, but um, yeah. So I know that eyewitness testimony is the single most unreliable evidence in a trial, and yet the most believed, as I'm sure you are aware. So do you think that relates to salience or neutrality? Because even people who are victims of crimes, immediate, sort of intimate, are not good at being eyewitnesses. Yeah, so... Um, that's kind of in part what this new study is going to look at because we want to see that if the amount of salience, or sorry, the emotionality of an image coming before or after affects whether or not it's remembered better. And so right now with eyewitness testimony, it's kind of a difficult thing to study because it's hard to make it like it would happen in the real world because in the real world there's never going to be like an instance where you can look at kind of what was happening during encoding. You can only kind of look at what happens after the fact of retrieval because, um, I mean, apart from simulating your own uh, crime or something like that, you can't really do that. So um, there's not much research out currently on that, and so that's what we're hoping, that we can just focus more on the um, emotion aspect of that, looking at that in this new study, and then maybe we'll be able to translate the results of that um, to give us future information on that answer. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>